Thank you so much, Naomi and Inigo and everyone else involved in organizing this event. Can you all hear me okay in the back? Yeah, I'll just keep it like that. I have to apologize because I, I'm not going to be able to stay for the reception at the end of the day because we, we have a start of term welcome to new students party in my department and I have to be there at five. Uh -huh. so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in a way David Spiegelhalter has said everything I want to say <laughs> but in a different way. And I hope you uh, benefit from the same message being given from two different perspectives. So, you know, I'm a philosopher of science as well as a historian of science. My business is to think about the nature of science, scientific knowledge, the place of science in broader society. So that's why I want to talk about, well, the scientific attitude and... Um, I want to think a little bit carefully together with you about how we apply the scientific attitude to science itself. And you'll see in a minute what I mean. So this conference is about the role of academia. I think we, we, we all agreed, right, that we want to fight misinformation. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting Freudian slip. <laughs> I think even the majority of people who believe and spread misinformation would actually agree that they want to fight misinformation because mm -hmm. the, the crap they believe is actually true. And yeah. So we all agreed about the red letters there, but this conference is not just about fighting misinformation. <laughs> Did it again? <laughs> but you know, what, what is the role of academia and the role of it in the, what you guys call information ecosystem. I, I, I like that idea because you know, there, there are different parts to this ecosystem. We all have different roles to play. So what is the role of academia? And I mean, there's an obvious role of academia, right? Which is to do good research, provide high quality information and theories and communicate it as much as possible to the other people. So I, I'm assuming we're all agreed about that obvious goal. But I want to look beyond that and also, as I put it there, underneath it. Right? Well, because um, we have to ask, right, because I get paid to do this, what does it mean to have good science? What is high quality information? And what does it mean for science to provide the correct understanding of phenomena. These are all questions that we deal with in the philosophy of science. And I think it's important to distinguish the role of academia from the role of individual academics, right? So what Giles was talking about, it's what, what we all should do as individual academics, but that's not the same question as to why we have such a thing called academia. So, you know, you, you could roughly translate that into the question of why we have universities. And in order to do research is not a good answer because you don't need universities to do research. You can just have research in institutes. You can do fantastic research in industrial labs, right? We have examples like the Bell Labs, the General Electric Laboratories. They can do research. You don't need universities. So why do we need academia. And the role of academia is also not the same as the role of people who are knowledgeable. I mean, aside from uh, just breaking down the illusion that we in the academia are the only knowledgeable people, uh, other kinds of knowledgeable people have their roles to play, right? Journalists, neighbors, right? parents. Uh, we're not the only people who may have better knowledge than some other people we're dealing with. So that's not really what this is all about. What is the role of academia? And here comes the question of engagement, right? These days it's fashionable to say that we want to be engaged in our academic work. Yeah, but <laughs> I don't think 
it's quite right to say our work needs to have immediate impact. This is the great flaw of the REF system, to measure impact in seven-year increments. I mean, that depends on your field, depends on your topic, but especially, right, if you ask about, yeah, what's the impact of philosophy? I mean, Honora O'Neill is a great exception in being listened to immediately by practically important people. How long does the impact of humanities research take to be evident? And this is even true in science as well, right? I mean, we have to remember that this is where the history of science comes in. We have to remember that our current fantastic civilization based all on electricity and electromagnetic theory, we only have that because Michael Faraday was playing around with magnets. We only have that because Luigi Galvani was, was taking delight in making dead frogs legs jump by applying, God knows what that was, right? <laughs> Galvanism, they called it, in honor of Galvani. They didn't know what it was, yet they investigated it with no particular notion of usefulness, right? So you know, you've all heard this, plea for pure science and all that. I think of it rather as being immediately engaged with social needs versus being a bit removed or being a bit academic or even philosophical. And removal is not being just absolutely useless. No, I think removal of this kind, we should think of as a broader ranging and longer term kind of impact. So what the ref is not going to reward us with, but yet. I think that's why we have academia, right? That, that's why people like me get paid a reasonably decent salary <laughs> to go and spend my days thinking about stuff that's not going to help anybody immediately. And you can say the same thing about the divinity faculty. You can say the same thing about English. You can say the same thing even about much of history, even about a lot of economics right? <laughs> Not that useful when they're doing the formal models of whatever. Okay, so this is the one, uh, probably the main message I want to convey, which is that we should really try hard to avoid a kind of dogmatism concerning science. Now, especially through COVID, we've become familiar with this phrase, follow the science. This is a problem, because science is not about following authority. The whole essence of science, as I see it, is questioning the authority, right? This, this is why we have modern science at all. If people were just following the authority of the church on the one hand, classical authorities on the other hand, there would never have been modern science. The whole point about modern European science was to say, look, I want to see for myself. So it doesn't do to say to the anti-vaxxers or whoever who say, I want to do my own research. I mean, it's really annoying, but the right answer is not, you don't know what you're talking about. We do, and you just listen, right? And this has been a particular dilemma for the progressive people, as we say, in the political sense, right? So if you wind the tape back a little bit, some of you are too young to have experienced this, but, you know, let's just say in the 1980s, maybe, 90s as well, there's a great fad of postmodernism in academia, in the humanities, right? People who really try to question the blind um, authority of science, the, the, the science, authority of science that people dogmatically respected, right? And humanities scholars, many of them in, in our field of history and philosophy of science, really dissected what happens in science, in scientific practice, and the communication of science in society, the political power of, of scientists, and they concluded, right, 
the authority of science has been inflated. And some even went as far as to say scientific knowledge is a social construction. Right? And this was the very much the progressive thing to do, right? It was considered, I mean, there's earlier context as well, right? Things like the Vietnam War in the US, where science was seen to be allied with the military industrial complex, and the progressive thing was to rebel against those who said, we know the science. Agent Orange won't hurt you. It's okay, just follow us, right? And now, the picture has changed. Right? I mean, 2016 being the watershed year with the election of Donald Trump. Now what have we got? We, we have progressives going on things like the March for Science. They're yelling, follow the science. They're saying, believe the authority. That's really weird, right? <laughs> Because progressives used to be like hippies who just question authority. Question authority used to be the big poster that people used to literally have upon their walls in their rebellious uh, university dorm rooms and things. And now it's far the science. This is really a dilemma. What is the way out? So I think this is where we have to calmly try to remember some basic things about the spirit of science, right? Is it, it is the spirit of open inquiry. It's the spirit of skepticism that is not destructive, but a res respectful questioning of, of what you are told to believe. And it's the spirit of experiment, right? What we don't know, but we're going to try out. And another thing that the history of science especially can give us is a degree of humility about the track record of science. Because when you look back at the history of science, what we realize is, well, you know, a lot of things that scientists used to be really confident about, we have now rejected. So, We've got to be aware of the possibility that future scientists will be looking back on us in the early 21st century and just laughing so hard about, what, dark matter? <laughs> Super strings? Come on, right? How could such smart people have believed such nonsense? It's <laughs> possible, right? And this is what happens when we now look back at the history of science, right? Wow, people were just completely convinced that Newton had the truth. Space and time were absolute, the law of gravitation was precise and exceptionless, and so on and so on. And they had good reason to believe it, as far as they could tell. So I think um, when we interact with people who don't seem to respect science, we need to have some basic respect for them, right? Because they are our fellow citizens. I mean, yes, there are malicious actors who deliberately spread misinformation, but I think that's not most people. We need to take them as well-intentioned, basically smart enough fellow citizens with whom we need to live. And this is now the luxury, it's a necessity. I mean, I could worry that any of you might be a terrorist, might be a thief. I've just left my bag there with my <laughs> laptop. How do I know that you're not going to run off conveniently? But I, I can't live if I think like that. So I have to take on faith right, that you're a reasonable human being with whom I'm going to live in this society. And uh, just one last note I, I want to add when we think about this danger of dogmatism about science is that when we make, on behalf of science, exaggerated claims of certainty and omniscience, that is going to backfire. Right? Because when we present scientific knowledge as the truth, whenever right, anything less than perfect 
comes out about science and scientific knowledge, people are going to say, ah, oh, that's, that was just a lie, wasn't it? You guys don't know the truth. You've changed your mind. I mean, danger of alcohol or consumption or whatever. Yes, science does change its story. But that is the essence of science. We learn and we believe different things as we learn. So if we present science as this perfect truth, then people are going to say, well, that's not the case. So that means I'm just, my opinion is just as good as the scientist's opinion. So it's this uh, warning with which I've actually opened my uh, recent book, which is an attempt to propose a more realistic ideal of scientific knowledge. I'm not going to tell you what's in the book, but <laughs> you can look it up if you're interested. So uh, let me try to start to sum up, right? Well, what is the scientific attitude? And, you know, I, I, previous speakers have mentioned basic empiricism, um, respect for evidence. I mean, I think we all accept that, to which I added these ideas of open inquiry, healthy skepticism, and experiment. But Empiricism, I think, is the core. It's the idea, roughly speaking, that experience is the only source of learning that we have. And, you know, this was once a radical idea, right? Back when knowledge was supposed to be from Plato and Aristotle, or from the Bible, or any other sources of external authority that were let's face it, human. Uh, instead, the scientific attitude that took root from, roughly speaking, the 16th, 17th century onward is empiricist, right? We're just going to have to experience stuff and see. And something that the pragmatist philosophers, whom I follow more than anything else, add to this is that even the scientific method is something that we learn empirically. God doesn't hand down the scientific method to us. We learn by doing. We learn from the experience of conducting inquiry. We learn from the experience of doing research what kind of method works out well. So there's this uh, sort of higher level empiricism, even about empiricism itself, right? I mean, why do we think empiricism is the right way to think about learning and about science and everything else? Well, because it seems to work out. <laughs> because there was a time, right, when many philosophers were of the more rationalist persuasion, right? I, I, I've named Plato already. They used to think that there was some kind of special intuition that the good philosopher had, which would allow us to see the way things really are. I think most of us, in, even in philosophy, have given up on this. Because right? <laughs> <laughs> what would give us the direct phone line to God? You'd really have to be seriously religious to believe that. And even, even most religious people don't think that phone line tells us about science. Right, so let's be empiric, empiric, empiricist about empiricism itself and about empirical science. And I think the key thing here is what I call the imperative of progress. Right, it's not empiricism is not just having a kind of idea that squares with the experience that you already have, but it, it's about learning. It's about experiencing other things that you haven't experienced and revising your ideas accordingly. So we leave open the possibility right, that the current best scientific method may fail, may stop working when we come into a very different kind of domain of experience. Right? That's also up to our further experience. I'm going to end with a story which I have from another person, it's a philosopher called Lee McIntyre, 
who's uh, one of the rare philosophers of science who have really engaged with the public. He's been very concerned with the anti-science or post-truth phenomenon. He's really been at the forefront of productive engagement with everyone, including conspiracy theorists and anti-vaxxers, everyone. So he, he has, uh, the, the most recent book of his is called How to Talk to a Science Denier. And from that book, I think I once heard him give a talk with this story. The story is about how he tried to really understand flat earth theorists, flat earthers as they like to call themselves. And he said, I, I need to go and see what they do. And he learned that the flat earth people actually have academic conferences, right? <laughs> There's an annual flat earth convention. So he Lee thought, I, I'm going to attend that because uh, he wanted to see well, what the hell happened when they got together. And he signed up, went to the conference, and he learned that they really gave academic papers to each other. They do empirical research. They, they have certain pieces of evidence that they really like to invoke, like some anomalous observation of ships going far out in the sea, yet being fully visible. Now, we like to say that that's just uh, due to some strange atmospheric conditions that created refraction. Nothing but a mirage, but to the flat earthers. No, no that's real evidence that you round earth people are suppressing. Right. Anyway, so he said it was really impossible to talk to them as the whole convention. <laughs> so he tried to peel off some individuals to, so he could engage in uh, dialogue. Now, this is the flat earthers standard map of the world. That's also the UN logo. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know the United Nations was founded by flat earthers, but there it is. <laughs> so the North Pole is in the middle. For the flat earthers, South Pole is a great myth. It doesn't <laughs> exist. It's instead this great boundary. It's a wall of ice. Right. Has anyone been to the South Pole? I mean, this time people have been to Antarctica, but usually not the South Pole. They've been to the ice wall here or there. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> the flat earth belief is that this means that the distance between the tip of South America and New Zealand is so great that there can't be a direct flight between the two places. So Lee heard this and, and engaged one of the flat earthers that he peeled off. And he, he entered, managed to get the guy to enter into a bet. So they were going to go and take that flight together. <laughs> From Chile, I think, to New Zealand. And let's see if there is such a flight. So he thought, God, that's a result. <laughs> Unfortunately, the flat earther didn't show up on the day of... Well, what is the lesson with which I'm going to finish? I, th the lesson from that story is that even if it looks like somebody is completely wrapped up in their bubble, there are points of contact with new experience that we can come up with. And the best way to engage with people is, people who believe different things, is to find points of direct empirical test that you can all agree about. And we have to remember again the lesson from the history of science, that even very reasonable people used to believe what now looks really incredible. Right? I mean, all the great thinkers of the Enlightenment, let's say. Right? I mean, everybody from Immanuel Kant to David Hume, Thomas Jefferson, none of them knew that water was H2O. Right? They all thought water was an element in the way of the ancient people. The great centuries of Chinese civilization was based on the belief that the earth was flat. Right? I mean, all the glorious culture and technology. I can say that. I'm not Chinese. I'm Korean. But um, they had a great thing going on the basis of the belief that the earth was flat and they were in the middle 
of this great flat world, hence literally the name of China, which is the Middle Kingdom. Right. So we have to be charitable, we have to be humble, and what we need to fight against is the close-mindedness of dogmatic belief in something, even if it's science, and the refusal to learn anything further. So I think, as many speakers have already expressed today, the worst thing we can do is to say, we have the truth, you guys are wrong and stupid <laughs> and ill-intentioned, and we're not going to talk to you. Right? There are limits to how much we can take, but I think if we give up on the effort, then that is not only a very uh, pessimistic way to look at the situation, but it is not ultimately the scientific way to look at things. Thank you. Yeah. In the modern era, do you recognize a value for blogademia? People putting academic work out on social media because the academic community is biased, it's dogmatic, and it's too difficult to get this stuff into that literature. Mm -hmm. I think so. I mean, that brings us back to the thought of the information ecosystem. I think the information ecosystem can use some diversity more than we have. And there will be noise and there will be pollution as well. There will be bad consequences as well as good. But I think on the whole, it does help to have, I mean, we talked about journals, different kinds of journals. And again, if you look at the history of science a little bit, we used to have a real variety of journal publications, everything from the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society to which you could only submit a paper if you are a fellow of the Royal Society or you could get a fellow to communicate it for you, to something that was called a Journal of Chemistry, Natural History and the Arts, edited by William Nicholson, which did no peer review at all, Nicholson himself, who was not a great academic, uh, just edited it. People wrote letters to him, and if he thought it was interesting and useful, he published it every month. It was quick, it was easy, but that journal published some of the great stuff, early work in electrochemistry by the likes of Humphrey Davy, who would have never got anywhere near Royal Society at the time. So anyway, the point is, yes, I, I think various ways of academic work being communicated and accepted, I think it is healthy. Yeah, I mean, in short, I don't think it's possible to separate the two completely. I can see what he means, right? That uh, if your scientific work is driven by advocacy, I think that does create problems, white hat bias and all the rest of it. But I, I don't. I mean, that, that relates to the distinction I was drawing between academia and academics. As, as individuals, right? So I think when we are speaking as individuals, 
we're not going to be able to avoid policy inclinations or wishes and hopes that we have. But I think as academia, that, that is not our collective role. Because our collective role as academia, I think, is this more removed kind of thing. So I think we, we end up with the ultimate dilemma of me as a person and me as a professional role, right? But I, I don't think the two could be separated completely. And that's just what we have to live with, I think. Actually, I was wondering of your, even what you're saying about being a member of a society or being approved or recommended, mm -hmm. and actually connection earlier to uh, journal med, journal editing. Yeah. So I was wondering what what are your thoughts on uh, anonymity in peer reviewing? Anonymity. Yes. Right. Uh, okay. I I don't know how this might relate to misinformation, but my view is that we need to get rid of it. <laughs> I'll tell you why I think it is. Uh -huh. because it's just the, it creates biases, right? I mean, uh -huh. It's just the knowing who's the author, knowing who's yeah. the editor, who's the reviewer. There are biases that uh, can, uh, you know, help some people, or maybe go against some others. Like, that's why I'm asking. So I think misinformation, bias, you know, so that's why I'm asking. Since you're asking, my, my very unorthodox view sure. on this is that the authors should remain anonymous. The reviewers need to reveal their identity. Because a lot of terrible peer reviewing happens behind the shield of anonymity. Very irresponsible stuff, especially by senior people. So I think the authors need to be protected by anonymity, but not the reviewers. Now, I, I know that's a controversial view, but... It's quite, I mean, my yeah. friend is actually, it is something that is openly yeah. debated, so 